I'm so glad to be with you again. This is exciting and we're gonna have a great time today. You know, 1 John 4 verse 4 says this, that we have already overcome the world, the Antichrist in the world, because greater is he who lives in us than he who is in the world. Thank God for that. Father, we just thank you for Jesus right now. We thank you that Jesus hasn't left us alone, but he said, I'm gonna send you a comforter and he's gonna lead you into all truth. He is the spirit of truth and he will reveal to you things to come. So right now we receive that help. We receive the help of the Holy Spirit to indulge in this word, this word of life, that we might discover the great plans and destiny that you have for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, I'm so glad that we get to talk about life part two. We're into life. Oh, it can't get any better than this. And this part two is all about, I'm going to dial a little bit more into this second identity of life called light. But a quick recap of what we've already learned in part one. There are three identities of life. They are truth. We really talked about truth a lot, but truth then a light, which is what we're gonna talk about in this session, and love. We focused on truth in part one. God is truth, God is light, and God is love. Oh, aren't you glad about that? We began to unfold the wisdom that life is first about the who before it's about the what. We went over this realization that life is birthed out of who, not what, identity, not purpose. And then we begin asking the critical questions because if you don't ask the right questions, you don't get the right answers. I told you, we keep coming back to that thought. We even heard Jesus remind us in John 8 verse 32. He said this, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Other translations say, make you free. Well, either way, we want to be free. As we dialed in on the element or the identity of truth being so crucial to life, we also ask about how your freedom of choice is essential to life. We discovered from the book of Galatians that our freedom can destroy our freedom. That's right. Freedom cannibalizing true liberty or freedom. And finally, we landed on how God is not religious, but wants relationship with you, relationship with all of us. True life is about having the freedom to have a relationship with God, along with, get this, along with all of his family benefits. Oh, we want that too. I concluded part one by telling you that I give you this simple how to respond to truth because if we don't apply it, if we don't respond, it's useless. I told you I would give you this simple how to respond to truth in this segment here, a practical approach that's non-religious and entirely relational. But first, let's begin to explore another dimension of life that comes through the second identity, light. God is light. Right now, there are a lot of people who want to tell you who you are for all kinds of reasons, some well-meaning, some nefarious, and mostly all just plain wrong. Lily Tomlin, the famous comedian, she's older now, but she once said this. She said, I've always wanted to be somebody, but now I realize I should have been more specific. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Entertainment and political voices play God by pushing designer identities from a superfluous menu of options. But we don't need to talk about their madness and their love of the crazy. No, no, no. What we do need to consider, though, is this question. Who is qualified to give us the secrets of life? Remember, God is truth. But in this edition, we're going to study God is light illumination. There's a reason why frauds, deceivers, and predators so easily get their voice heard today as a life guide for your future or for your kid's identity, because there's been a ridiculous vacuum of truth, of light, illumination. This is why it's critical that we talk about and study the true meaning of life, the true meaning of life. And the identity of light, or say it this way, the person of light, it'll help us illuminate the way so we can find our way to truth, to life. We have to be able to answer the big questions regarding this thing called life. Who? 
what and why and who am I and what's my purpose and, 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 and why was I ever born? Can somebody tell me? You know, when I was a boy, because of the circumstances in my family, the rejections and the hurts, I heard a message in my head that I was worthless, that I was ugly, I was a failure, I was useless. I didn't intend to believe a lie or even want to. It just became a way, a mental reflex, if you will, to deal with all the sadness, the depression, the rejection. Here's what I heard, just, just accept it so you can begin to compensate. This is who you are, so deal with your truth and just move on. But my mom, she would encourage me to read God's word, God's truth, and see what God would say about me. And as I began to re read, I'm gonna be honest with you, I had a crisis in my thinking. God's word totally contradicted my belief system that was already being shaped and formed and that I was accepting. It was painful at times. I would have Jesus ask me, he would say, what would it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? The Lord was in fact telling me that my soul was worth more to him than the whole wide world. And I was already adjusting to just being worthless and a person of absolutely no consequence with no destiny. I was just getting comfortable with dying. And now Jesus was breathing new life into me. Yes, at times it hurt. It was painful. I needed God's amazing grace to be resurrected into his new thinking. I needed to come up out of those waters. I hope you got to see in part one those amazing young people responding to life in the waters of baptism. That was a response to truth in their lives. That was the power of light at work. To answer the fundamental questions that resonate with all of humanity, we've got to go way beneath the surface, down to the root level, so to speak, beyond the visible into the invisible, to the source. You see, light leads to life. Light is the force of life, the identity of true life. We know that natural light from the sun has so many benefits for this planet like energy, photosynthesis, illumination, just to name a few. And a blind person may have less benefit from natural light, but still life is dependent upon it. Helen Keller, she once said this, walking with a friend in the dark is better than walking alone in the light. You see, being blind didn't mean Helen wasn't ignorant to the illumination of true friendship and true relationship. Psalm 139, verse 11 to 12. This is so good. The psalmist said, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the night shall be the only light about me, even the darkness hides nothing from you, God, but the night shines as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to you. God's light. Don't ever think God can't reach you in your darkest, darkest hour. He is light. Oh, did you know that the realm of the physical, we only see a small portion of the light that is actually present. Even the best of human eyes only have a narrow bandwidth of spectrum to all the wavelengths of light about us. Bees, get this, bees can actually see ultraviolet light. That's right. They see these amazing patterns of light on flowers and it helps them target the nectar. Isn't God amazing? Let's put it this way. We see far less in this world than what there is to see. And that's even more true with regard to the spiritual forces all around us. Life is way more dynamic than your optical perception. There is a far greater dimension to light than goes beyond the universe. There is an intellectual and a spiritual origin of light in which God alone is the essence of. Why has God told humanity to not make any graven images of him? Because his word clearly says he is light. Colossians 1 verse 15 reminds us that God is invisible. We just talked about how most of the light around us is not perceived by the human eye. That doesn't mean it isn't powerful, even in a natural way. So then, what about God? If bees can see something that you can't see, does it mean it doesn't exist? 
This is basic to life because we tend to be tormented by what we don't see. But we can be comforted and empowered by God Almighty by believing in Him and trusting in Him. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, God is light and there is no darkness in Him at all. Why is this such a great revelation to our life, to your life? So much of our striving as humanity is to become, to evolve into some sense of being that actually matters, that would answer all of our whys and our whats. We want answers. You should want answers. Martin Luther King Jr. once said this. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So perfectly said. Yes, we need answers. Power over darkness. Power over ignorance. Let's face it, we pursue temptations outside the boundaries of our morality because we want answers, enlightenment, experiences that just seem to satisfy the nagging um, question of why am I here? What's it all about? Jesus said this to us about walking, living, and progressing in life. John 12, verse 36. He said, while you have the light, believe in the light, have faith in it, hold to it, rely on it, that you may become sons of the light and be filled with light. Wow. This is profound. This is a life answer here. We become who we are when we believe who he is. The conclusion of this is we get filled up or lit up or empowered to fulfill our destiny when we believe in the light, capital L. Who's the light? God is light. And Psalm 90 verse 2, it says that God has no beginning or no end. He's everlasting. God, as the beginning of light, as the being of light, made everything that exists from energy. We know from discoveries in science that all matter exists from energy. So who are you? Well, you're called to be a child of light and to be filled with God's light. Light is illuminating, it's answering, it's empowering, it's order in the place of chaos. Have you ever woke up in the morning and felt like your life is just going nowhere? I just like, oh, I just feel like I'm going nowhere. Well, look at Acts chapter 17, verse 28. It says, for in him, and who is him? Light, in him we live and move and have our being. In who? In God. And who is? Light. So in light, we live, move, and have our being. In illumination, we live, move, and have our being. You know, one time I was down south, and I was on the road doing some touring, and I was in a hotel, and it, this hotel had the ability to have such a blackout bedroom, and I got up in the middle of the night and went to go to the bathroom, and without the illumination, I didn't want to wake up Pam, I smashed right into the edge of the door. I, I broke my toe, blackened my eye. We need illumination. We shouldn't be living, moving, and having our being without some illumination. So as we discussed in part one, life has movement. We want to be moving, but movement toward order, not brokenness, movement toward growth, toward blessing. Faith is believing in light, not seeing light. I've said it many times, but here we go again. The unseen world steers the seen world. Hebrews 11 verse 3. By faith, we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed, fashioned, put in order, there's that word order, and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God, so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says that what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now, of course, there are basic elements that make up the universe, things like hydrogen, oxygen, helium, but these things hold little clue to the answer of who, what, why regarding your existence, regarding you, your destiny, your eternity. We need to look beyond the finite to the infinite. For example, quantum physics has just begun to discover that we all have a power of free will giving us this, the ability to make choices of thought. 
These thoughts release proteins and chemicals that customize your brain. Now, science can measure your free will because your thinking collapses a probability into an actuality. Wow. Yes, your thinking becomes matter. Why does that matter? <laughs> well, who made this happen? It sure wasn't carbon or oxygen that gave you this power. The harder science runs, the more it's playing catch up to God's identity as light, illumination. Lord Kelvin, he was an eminent physicist. He actually helped successfully install the first telegraph cable under the Atlantic Ocean. He said this, he said, if you think strongly enough, you will be forced by science to believe in God. Isaac Newton, maybe a name you know better, he was recognized as one of the greatest mathematicians and again, a physicist of all time. He said this, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Very smart people saying the same thing. The three elements of life, truth, light, and love. God is truth, light, and God is love. And you, you are made in the image of God. Truth, light, and love. You're made for truth, light, and love. First John chapter one, verse five says this, God is light and there is no darkness in him. No, not any. Praise God. Once again, God doesn't just light up the place. He is the very essence of light, illumination, intelligence. God's word is that creative light. It's the Bible. Jim Gafkin once said, he said, have you ever read a book that changed your life? He says, no, me neither. <laughs> Look, you got to get lit. So you got to get the truth. The God of the Bible is the source and the beginning of all life. You got to read the book. Genesis 1 makes that clear. When God was creating this universe, he spoke light into the darkness and the intelligence of who he is followed up by dividing the created light from the darkness, the day from the night. That's because God's light always moves from chaos to order, never from order to chaos. That sounds simple, but it's extremely significant. The law of entropy is part of the fall of mankind, our sin. God set the order of life for life. Our humanity made a choice in the Garden of Eden to reverse that order and invite the curse of sin and thereby death. The tree of knowledge gave humans the power to know good and evil. Before that, Adam and Eve only knew good. They only knew God's presence and all the benefits of walking with him in unbroken relationship unbroken fellowship. Now this new knowledge predisposed them to always move from good to evil, from whole to broke, from well to sick, from right to wrong. Things evolve downward from strong to weak, from alive to dead, from light to dark. So much for the closed system we call evolution. We need a savior who can give us light, who is the source of light. By the way, God is that illumination. He is life. That's why in part one, we discussed what Jesus said in John 14, verse six. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by and through me. True light is the answer, the way, and the illuminating force of all life, the intelligent blueprint of life. Albert Einstein he said this, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created our problems. That's right. We've got to get out of the dark and step into the light of life. So let's expand that question we left off hanging in part one. How do we respond to truth? How do we walk in the light? The goal being so we can live life and live it strong, live it to the ultimate. After all, Ephesians 5 verses 8 and 9 said this, for once you were in darkness. Well, we, we just talked about that. We know that. But now you are in the light, in the Lord. We walk as children of light. For the fruit, the effect, the product of the light or the spirit consists in every form of kindly goodness, uprightness of heart, and trueness of life. Well, by George, that's what we want. 
we're getting some answers here. We learned in part one that we live life in the truth. Now we're told that we live as children of light by walking in light. So you have your identity in God's truth and you're walking in his light. Here are the four basic simple applications that we can work to be in truth, to stay in light, to choose life. Number one, it's simple. Obey. Obey. Simple. This is why humility is essential to our response to the truth and to light. It's the way of life. Jesus did it as he walked on the earth. Are we better than Jesus? Jesus was obedient as both the Son of Man and the Son of God. He showed up how to align. He showed us how to align perfectly with truth and light by obeying Father God. Number two, praise. Praising God is amplifying the power of truth and the force of light in your life. It defeats lies. It defeats sickness, demonic strategies that would be set against your family. It defeats confusion, depression, and it enforces life. Let me tell you a little secret. You need to know this and apply this for the times that are about to manifest here on earth. Praising God is part of your protection and your direction. And number three, attend. Truth simply says, pay attention. Light illuminates so that you can spiritually see what's coming and pay attention. When you pay, you give something, don't you? God's word tells us that the ultimate currency God is looking for is your attention, your trust, your reliance. Attend, not to a building, but to the person, the identity of God. And fourth, imitate. God said, be holy for I am holy. Paul said, imitate me as I follow Christ. God always gives a model to promote his plan, preparation, conditioning, and repetition. We live in a lazy experience craving culture. Swipe left, swipe up, entertain me, give my kids something to do. I need an experience to feel alive. Really? Because the truth says you need to study to show yourself approved. Light says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. An experience won't do that. Jesus fed the multitudes and the crowd turned around and crucified them. So even Jesus being the conference speaker alone doesn't convert you. That's God's work of grace. You need first priority of the word of God, period. You must practice hearing truth, attending to the truth, seeing the light so you can imitate freedom. You don't want to be one of the foolish virgins Jesus talked about walking away with no oil in a dark place someday. To imitate or model God means you imitate his truth, walk in light. It means you watch and listen, and then you act on his instructions. In part three, we're going to go over these simple four steps one more time because we'll ramp up to the third and greatest identity of life, love. Oh, you're going to love love. <laughs> but knowing you, I'm sure you don't want to wait. In case you haven't responded to God's truth yet, God's word says today, today is the day of salvation. So I'm with you. Let's not wait. In a few minutes, we're going to have communion together, and I want you to be a part of that family time. That means you need to step into the light right now, and because of God's amazing grace, that simply requires you to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That's your faith connecting with God to give you life. Pray this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe you are the Son of God. I know you died on the cross for me. Forgive me for all my sins. I want to walk in the light. Help me to live for you. Fill me with your life, your hope and strength. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.